look forward to seeing you again in March for Vanessa Haycox exploring Western India from the saddle of a Royal Enfield motorcycle. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank you for taking this moment to silence your cell phones, please. Tonight, educator, photographer, and technologist A.J. Bars will share his insights as a father teaching his now five-year-old the value of travel and exploration through adventure school in the Pacific Northwest. He will sh share stories, philosophy, and photography from his experiences traveling the Pacific Northwest, Japan, and Europe. Please help me in welcoming A.J. Bars, traveling and trekking with a toddler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Billy. And it's bar safe for the record. It's okay. We're still besties. Just, you know, like and subscribe. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, I just wanted to start off with this shot, which is um, my youngster, Dorian, um, atop of a very uh, site that pretty much everybody here in the Pacific Northwest, and especially here in Bellingham, Billy, you're going to have to go up there if you haven't, it's the Oyster Dome. And this was his first ascent. And we're gonna come back to this because it took a lot to get from where, he, you know, having a little bundle of joy to a mountain goat, as my podcast partner would, would call it, um, sitting on the bluff of the Oyster Dome at under the age of four. Darkness is coming, is that the cue for bringing the lights down? Okay, so uh, because I am an educator, I, I, I do have to like give the whole, you know, heads up of like what's coming up in the presentation. Um, so I've got my origin story as well as uh, a bit of my wife's and our family. Uh, going into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, camera gear because as a professional photographer and uh, someone in the digital arts for over two decades, I get asked the same question over and over again. You'll see what that question is. And then I have three phases that um, my family kind of uh, got into travel, which is travel before the child, and then travel after the child, which looks very different, and then travel derailed, which is what we've been living for the last two years, and that is the pandemic, and uh, me creating what I call adventure school. And my, I, my, my student of one, you know, graduating with every year that he gets older in the pandemic. So my backstory, or as I like to call it, origin stories, because that's what Marvel likes to do, right? I'm cool as a, as a you know, superhero, right? Okay. Uh, this is me in my natural habitat. Uh, I am, uh, I'm AJ Barsay. I am a photographer, an educator, a uh, technologist at Western Washington University, and a podcaster. Um, I'm one half of the Bellingham podcast, as well as the Analog Explorer, which is a solo show that I do. And before I was all of any of that, I was this. So this is off of VHS. This is how I grew up, okay? This is over in Kitsap County, circa 1990-something. And this is me and my dad out in the outdoors. And this is what I remember most of everything. There's my mom. What's up, mom? You're probably watching the live stream. And this is me in my natural habitat, even at the age of eight, nine, 10. Looks a lot like my kiddo right now. Uh, getting dirty, getting into things, always out in the mountains, and, uh, this was the best part of life for me. And quite frankly, it shaped who I was. And at the time, I just thought this was normal. Like, this is what everybody does. Everybody lives, like, in the Pacific Northwest. There's mountains, there's sea. Well, then I grew up and I met people, and that's not the case. But for me, this was normal. And so as I grew up and got into the digital arts, my essence of, of the Pacific Northwest, my ethos, kind of came into my art form. Uh, as a professional photographer, I shoot pretty much three things pretty regularly, love, travel, and portraits. Uh, and out of it, the essence of, of, of what the Pacific Northwest means to me, you can see throughout my photography. And whether it's uh, working in the outdoors, because most uh, couples in the Pacific Northwest love the backdrop, the natural studio that is our outdoors, or working portraiture, uh, or, I don't know, doing Essence of Bellingham, uh, with a somewhat famous shot, notorious shot, infamous shot, don't know, didn't see who he talked to. So that's me as an artist. Now, I mentioned gear, because usually if, if, you're, if you're a traveler and you know that one person who's a photog, you always, you always hit them up because they're your best friend. And 
hopefully you buy them Hana Teriyaki for any information they give you. But the common question I always get is this, and I just want to get it out of the way right now, because if you're watching this right now and you want to know what the best camera is, I'll tell you, okay? Here's the secret. What I use, as I preface, is mirrorless cameras. And I'm going to actually walk over here. Sorry, cameramen. Because I brought props. So uh, a couple of years ago, or quite some years ago, about a decade ago, um, I switched to mirrorless. And if you're not familiar with the technology, basically cameras back in the inception of single lens reflexes, so you know, DSLRs or SLRs, single lens reflex. There's a mirror where you put your eyeball down and you can see through your lens. Well, fast forward five, six decades, and we got smarter, better, and faster because these things that we have in our pocket, they don't have a mirror. And this is a direct-to-sensor camera, a really good one. It's very expensive. So camera makers caught off with this, and they took the mirror out. And by doing so, it made cameras a lot thinner, smaller, lighter, pocketable, travelable. Sorry, <laughs> travelable. And when uh, I was having lunch with a colleague of mine uh, over in Kitsap, he kind of bet me lunch that his little mirrorless camera could stand toe to toe with at the time was one of the best DSLRs on the market. So I took the bet and he proved me wrong. It, it was actually just as good, I mean, good image quality. And the thing that he could trump me with is I wasn't carrying a big tank with me everywhere I needed to go. And the value of that is extraordinary when you want to travel. Now, a lot of people say that the, uh, Chase Jarvis out of Seattle is typically attributed with the quote, the best camera you can have is the one that, that you have on you. And I tend to agree with a couple of caveats. See, I also still shoot film. And my little one also loves the magic that is this little piece of plastic that has this weird looking image, but it's, it's, a, it's a photo. And there's something, there's something about that that is still magical, if you think about it. This really isn't magical. This is just ones and zeros, and we're used to it. And when you have infinite storage, infinite time, infinite battery, mm, I don't know, photography loses a, a little bit of something. And film kind of re-brings that back to the foreground. Because really, you're limited to 24 exposures. You're limited to what light you have on hand. You have to be more present. And that's something that I see that lacks a lot in photography, because you can just kind of spray and pray, as a lot of photographers say, and you'll get a shot eventually. Whereas when you only have a roll of film, you're limited to that. It, it's that essence of minimalism that you find creativity. And quite frankly, some of my, my favorite shots, family shots, not pro shots, um, come from just carrying a 50-year-old camera. This little guy right here, that top shot, of uh, Dorian sitting uh, on his way to ascend Twin Lakes and Winchester Mountain, shot off of this. This is 50 years old and was some of the best technology of its time, and digital just got to what this already achieved. And as a technologist, I find that intriguing because both of these do the same thing, they capture images, but with film, I don't have to worry about, is a JPEG gonna be out of date? Is 40 megapixels enough? Film is film. And for me, there's an essence of preserving a legacy, you know? Uh, even though it's analog and it's older, doesn't necessarily mean that it's less good. So as I, I talk about my travel log, it comes a lot of the time from my digital side, but a lot of the shots that I do for me, which I think photography needs to get more, uh, more in tune with, a less of sharing with social media and doing it for the gram and doing it for yourself or doing it for your family, okay, you're doing it for friends. And that's really what I think film helps bring, especially this pro photog, back to. In essence, film slows you down, and that's a good thing. We're always, especially the pandemic, right, we're always on, we're always connected, we're tweeting, like even before this, I was helping tweet everything out. And really, when you're doing that, are you really present? And really, when you look at your photography, if you're doing it for the sake of the gram or how you present or stage something, are you doing it for an audience or are you doing it for you? So for me, film helps kind of rein me back a little bit because yes, as a businessman and as an entrepreneur, I'm promoting myself, but there's another part and this presentation has photos that n has never been seen. Like uh, the, you, you are, you're seeing in the debuting live um, because for the last five years, 
um, I don't really talk about my son publicly in uh, either online or in any, any uh, podcast of, of reputability in Bellingham. So this is kind of all, uh, kind of all new. The other thing I love about old film cameras and film technology is that when you have a mirrorless camera, you can have really, really good glass for really cheap. So uh, you can see over here on the right is uh, an Olympus OM-1 from 1970. It's probably my favorite film camera ever created. Sorry, Leica. Uh, and that camera really pioneered what we have today. And that lens can also be mounted to my state-of-the-art Sony a7 body, and I can still use it. And what's great about that is that it's super fast glass and it's really cheap. If you're uh, watching this and if you're a student of photography and you want to know where to start, you know, looking at older equipment, older is not necessarily bad. And it's just as fun because it's manual focus, you still have to pull focus, and you gain skills. Now the technologist side of me is going to come out a little bit because the future is in the metaverse, not. But the technology around it is really intriguing. Um, we've had 360 spherical cameras for quite some time. They still haven't caught up to par yet with the bigger guns that I, I've mentioned before, but they have a fun factor. See, a lot of the time you use 360 for virtual environments and stuff, but you also can just do fun, twizzly stuff with your kid. And it gives you a different perspective, especially the, you have two kind of uh, formats with 360. You have the wormhole, which is over on the left, and you have Tiny Planet on the right. And especially if you're standing on top of a mountain, whether it's here in the Pacific Northwest or in Colorado, Billy, you know, when you have that on a little pole and you look down on a mountain, like that's, that spherical camera is giving you a bird's eye view without the need of a drone. You know, there's a lot that can be done there. If anything, it just gives you great, a way to do um, panoramic photos without having to do this, like you're looking at like your dowsing rod, a photo, you know? You just set it and forget it. And again, that's the, kind of the notion that I like about 360 is you kind of have to set it and walk away. You get to enjoy the experience and let the technology be a tool. Let it do its thing, okay? It's not necessarily always about the gear. So much so that there's this company, GoPro, that really kind of pioneered this, right? Surfer gone technologist creates a indestructible camera that can go anywhere, like summiting Mount St. Helens, which was what I did last season. And What's great about it is you can be pummeled for 14 hours on the side of a mountain and not have to worry about your gear. And that's, that's something that I hear time and time again is if you have very expensive equipment, you know, are you, are you really taking the photos that you want to preserve or are you preserving your camera equipment so that you can take more photos later? And so I like having equipment that can do the job, it's a tool. So to get to my point, if you're asking yourself, okay, AJ, I get all that. Now, what's the best camera? Do I get the GoPro? Do I get the A7? Come on. Is it a Leica? The best camera is the one that gets out of your way and lets you be better present and helps you better remember the present. Because that's why you're taking a photo, right? Hopefully. That's what I do. So I'm going to segue into traveling. So the first phase, traveling before a child. So for me, it's me and my wife. We both have the same ethos of the Pacific Northwest. It is very much a part of us. We were born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. And the, the, the academic in me is going to come out a little bit. This is a map circa 1930-ish uh, out of the, um, the Kroll Map Company out of Seattle. And it's called the Evergreen Playground. It's by far my favorite map of our region ever created. It hangs on my wall in my, in my uh, work at home studio and, and office. And when you look at this and the notion that they called it, even back then, the Evergreen Playground, it really surmises how I grew up, that first video of VHS that I showed you. You know, because when I, when I grew up, like, I saw this and I went, you know, I felt like I was living in the fjords and all the things I would read in National Geographic of, like, Iceland and stuff. If you look at the P Puget Sound, like, that, that is our region. We have this huge fjord and we have oceans and we have mountains within an hours of each other. I mean, Bellingham has the sea to ski for a reason. Like, you can do it all in one day. That's a treasure. And when I talk to people that are from the, you know, inside of our, our uh, country or on, uh, on the coast and stuff, there's all national treasures everywhere. But here, we have this evergreen gem that really, it's kind of like the best worst kept secret 
And for me, there's something about this that if you understand this region and you understand what it provides, it just kind of sticks with you, whether you're a transplant Billy or if you're, you know, originally from here. Now, my wife also came from here as well, and she grew up as well as backpacking and, and doing all of the outdoorsy stuff. And really, that makes us both uniquely Cascadian. That's how I like to call us. I'm not local, I'm not native of here, I'm just Cascadian. And largely because here, you know, my wife and I, we grew up being out in these outdoors. This was as much a school, as much as, for me, it is where I consider my church. This is so much a part of me that like the, the, the rivers could probably spill out of my, my veins. Uh, Lord knows I've probably drowned in them a few times, so like th it's, there's enough there. But being on top of our mountains, drinking our, our, our water, you know, this is all a part of me, and it, as I've shown you, it became a part of my art form and what I see. And wherever I travel, there's parts of the Pacific Northwest that has taught me what to look for when I travel to other places. And that's kind of important. Wherever we travel, you kind of want, when you, when you go to a new place, you know, what perceptions are you bringing with you? You know, we, I, I hear this a lot, like, when you travel, you know, Americans stick out. Okay, well, why do we stick out? Well, we're loud. Okay, well, there's one thing. You know, we eat like, like heathens, you know. There's a lot of things that make, you know, Americans stick out. And if you have that introspection of knowing where you come from and where, when you travel somewhere, what you bring with you, well, you're a more savvy traveler. And for me, in the 38 years that I've existed on this planet, um, the Pacific Northwest really has opened my eyes to that. Where else can you literally wake up one morning that is outside of your tent, you go about hiking, whatever, then that night you bunker down, this photo is actually featured by the national parks. Um, this was actually a funny story, uh, that was a storm coming in that we didn't know about, and it was the largest lightning storm I've ever seen at Alpine, terrifying, uh, in a tent, but uh, it's one of those things where it reminded me that, you know, Mother Nature has its own clock and apps aren't correct. You know, you have to be in tune with what your surroundings when you're out in, in nature. And even me, somebody who loves being out in the wilderness regularly, sometimes Mother Nature does a mic check on me. But meanwhile, if you don't like that, you can always drive down to the coast. It's not as warm as Florida. But we do have our coastlines that are dotted with what looks like shark's teeth flipped up. At least as I was a kid, that's what I thought of. Maybe they were dragon teeth, you know? As a kid, this whole region is a huge imagination narrative waiting to be written. But you have to cultivate it, you know? The other thing that's crazy about this is, this is a shot uh, up in our mountains in the Cascades, and I don't care how good of a Photoshopper you are, you are never going to create that photo. Like, that is a one of a kind, one morning, I got up at the right time, and it's there, you know? When we look around, it's funny, when you go to Europe, a lot of people love the frescoes of Italy or maybe in France. And yet, if we, f we forget here in the Pacific Nor Northwest to look up just here, we have frescoes, they're in our skies. And it's just funny to have that perspective. And I have that because I came from here. Of course, we have our mountains. Uh, they have taught me probably more than uh, anything else because the mountain doesn't care. It doesn't care if you live or you die, if you summit or not, the mountain's just gonna be it. And that's a part of a, an ethos that I, I talk about on the podcast a lot, is that, you know, for me, being out in the mountains, I'm not one of these crazy uh, Alex Honnold, no offense Alex, I think you're crazy dope, but I'm not one of these, you know, crazy guys that are gonna summit 10 peaks in 10 weeks. I'm not. For me, it's more, almost of a, of a, a religious uh, uh, progression when I go out into the wilderness um, because I'm looking to be more in tune and being more disconnected. This is on the east side of our state. A lot of the time the Pacific Northwest gets all of the credit, but the east side also has phenomenons that we don't see over here, especially bitter cold. Uh, this is Palouse Falls, and it was about eight below. So my... Uh, my lovely wife and I got, got there, woke up early to get this shot of the falls 
um, the sidewalls completely like sandblasted in snow and my batteries lasting about 15 and a half minutes um, to take a shot of a you know nearly frozen waterfall. Uh, it's cold, but it's cool, okay? And we don't really get that on this side. The last thing that I'm gonna bring up is the fact that the one thing that I, I love about the Pacific Northwest and I mentioned before is that Mother Nature mic checks us. And so much so, especially in the pandemic, we got so wrapped up in work and dealing with school and trying to be more connected while still maintaining high level of productivity and mental sanity. Um, and it's funny because like the stressfulest time that I could look in the pandemic is still not as stressful as the moment that I was stuck up on a mountain at 6,500 feet caught between two lightning storms, one above and one below me. And what do you do? And it's those moments that kind of help me realize, even in my most stressful moment, even in a pandemic, what really matters and how one thinks through things. And these skills are because I've been doing it since I was Dorian's age. So really, Cascadia, and to be uniquely Cascadian, is the best travel you're gonna get without a passport. So regardless of where you wanna go, and even in, during lockdowns, more and more people, I saw all kinds of people out on the trail. Some for the first time. And that excites me more than ever because I hope more and more people get the perspectives that our Pacific Northwest provide, provided me. But most people here are probably wanting to know the other side. Let's talk about passport travel, <laughs> okay? Because we've been in lockdown for two years. Um, even myself, I have been antsy to go. And for me, uh, it kind of starts with my wife. So my wife was a more of a worldly traveler before I, I got a late start. I, I went through a lot of school, I did a master's degree. Um, and my wife had already been to Europe a few times. So when we got married, we piled all of our, t uh, our time for vacation as well as fundage and our honeymoon, and we did a grand tour of Europe. And the thing is, is that both of us being trekkers, you know, we, for several weeks being in Europe, we lived out of those bags. We are carry-on people. The one bag people, that's us, okay? One bag for all of your stuff, me, I have another camera bag, and that's it, that's how we go. Because when we travel, and it, just to prove it, like that there's your purse, there's your bag, there's nothing, no, there's no, no Photoshop, I know what you're thinking in the back, you Photoshop something, nah man. And the thing is, is that because again, it's kind of like film, you know, it, you work within a confinement because that way you can, wor you can move faster, you can go more places, and you don't have to worry about stuff. Again, kind of like cameras, are you more worried about your gear when you're stuck on a mountain or doing your art form? And so traveling light has always been our ethos. And going around, especially it, for me, this was my first uh, foray into Europe. I've been to Canada uh, loads of times leading up to this, but for me, this was my first time stepping on a different continent and crossing the Atlantic. And, you know, my wife was watching the dumbstruck face of just like me going, oh, cool. <laughs> so this is the Arc de Triomphe in uh, Paris. And for me, like looking at this, I was amazed at the poetry that is the chaos of that huge, huge, huge traffic circle. It's just insane. And for me, I, I relate a lot of things into watches, which you'll, you'll see a little bit later, but it looked like a tourbillon. If you've ever seen a tourbillon mechanism in a watch, it just keeps on going and keeps perfect time. And when you look at the Arc of Triumph, it looks completely cray cray for driving, but yet nobody gets hit. Hopefully, things might have changed. but. The other thing about Paris, it's always known as the city of light, and so obviously being a photographer, I, I'm going to play that up, it delivered. You know, it's one of those things where everywhere you look in Paris, you know, even if it's cloudy, it looks crazy cool. Um, and on top of that, if it's rainy or if it's cloudy, there's less tourists, which always makes me happier. So you can go to more places and not have to worry about selfie sticks. Um, my, my friends in Paris will laugh at that joke because there's a lot of selfie sticks. But the thing is, is that I chase skies and I chase light and rain or shine. That's a Pacific Northwest thing. We don't melt up here. You know, you put on another layer, you know, North Face, whatever. But when it is spring in Paris, it is pretty much poetry and light, uh, whether you love the Eiffel Tower or not, or if you just love going down some crazy back alley just to find a really good street crepe. Uh, Paris is one of those places where it, it, there's some magic there. 
Now, on top of that, you also kind of take, I, I, I just actually had this conversation with a colleague of mine that's in Paris right now. And it's funny because in Europe, there's a scale to things. Like the, the Eiffel Tower is huge. Like you look at the Space Needle, it's cute. The Eiffel Tower is huge. Then you go to London and Big Ben is enormous, okay? Or to pull from a British uh, geek trope here, uh, it's bigger on the inside. Like it is huge to see that huge, huge clock tower, okay? Take any clock tower you've ever seen in America and it just looks dinky, okay? And it's those notions that I, I you know, it makes me giggle because it, it makes me feel like a little kid, being like, whoa, it's really cool. It's just a really big tower. Meanwhile, most London people are just like, you know, get out of my way, I need fish and chips. It's new points of view. And that's what I love when I travel, okay? Whether it's Europe, Pacific Northwest, United States, wherever, Canada. And whenever I travel, I, I always look for these. How many of you have ever used one of these, a viewfinder? Yeah, and we all have, okay? Now, probably not so much now as an adult, but as a kid, especially if I had a coin op, okay, I always w would go over to my dad and be like, do you have a quarter? I want to go see what's in it. Of course, my dad would be like, boo, here's some uh, the binoculars. They're free. But I always thought they were really cool, and as an adult, uh, I've kind of made it a thing to go and photograph them, and I've never really compiled this. So we're going to play a little bit of a game, okay? It's a teacher and me. We're going to have a little bit of participation, okay? So this should be a pretty easy one. Where do you think this viewfinder was found? Yeah, it was in Paris. There's the, you can kind of see the Arc de Triomphe in the background, right? Okay, let me see if I can trick you up. Where do you suppose this one is? <laughs> Good job, Dorian. It's also Paris. It's funny. We think viewfinders look in my mind, I always thought they were always the same. Here's the same city, two different viewfinders, okay? Okay, let me see if I can trick you up again. Anybody want to name the city? Midwest, Seattle, Portland. There's Portland, okay? This one has a tattletale in it. How about this one? Japan, this is in Yokohama. You're cheating, you were there, little dude. Okay, okay here's an easy one. Billingham. Last one. This one I thought was really unique. The Inner Harbor, open Vic uh, Victoria. Mm -hmm. So it's something like that, something as simple, something as trivial as this little kid that's all grown up that does and chases viewfinders wherever he goes, any country, any continent, okay? And it's funny because I always find it interesting when a city puts one out because, especially as a photographer, like I'm always looking around and seeing what I want to photograph and these are uh, little waypoints for a city to kind of showcase something in my mind. So I'm always curious to see what a city thinks a person would want to see, okay? And that, that was kind of the whole impetus of why I did the, the 48 degrees north, 122 degrees west photograph for Essence of Bellingham. You know, that was our viewfinder. The other thing I love whenever I go somewhere, and really Europe opened my eyes to this, was the stark difference between new and old. Everything here in the United States is new, <laughs> comparatively speaking. And what's interesting is we always complain like, you know, I, I live out in the Tweed 20 and like when roads are all correct, cracked and decrepit and stuff. And meanwhile, like I've walked streets that like predate our entire country. And they're like, you know, cobblestone and still beautiful. And I'm like, what the heck is this? What's interesting whenever I go to an, uh, an older country or an older city is how they deal with the new and the old. Like the way that new buildings are incorporated with old architecture, because each culture, each uh, continent does it a little bit different. And like Paris, versus say uh, London. Very different in how they, they do it. Uh, and it's hard for me to articulate it, other than the fact that it just makes you think, kind of like the gargoyles, that the, the, the gallery of Chimera that used to sit on top of uh, uh, Notre Dame. And it just makes me think like, you know, if this gargoyle could talk, and I know a lot of, a lot of photographers have made this, this analogy, but you know, if that gargoyle could talk, you know, what would it say as that city has changed over years? Any city, any piece of art, if it could talk, like we're right now, we're right here in, in the museum and I'm looking at all of these great photographs from 
years past, like the old lodge up at Mount Baker and such, you know. And all pieces of art, sculptures, architecture, photography, they're moments in time. And th this is an important thing for me because uh, for me, uh, one of my catchphrases for photography is every moment has a story. And it's important for us to not just appreciate the art for what it is or what it looks like for Instagram, but the stories behind them, you know, and carry those stories. Uh, this is a shot of Sacre Coeur. I just put it in there because I thought it looked nice. <laughs> Daydreaming of Paris. So getting into the art and history, um, so here's an example of, you know, a blending of old and new within the city line of Paris. And also when you go to the Louvre, right, this is something that very much is a juxtaposition of old and new. Um, the Wings of Semethrace, which I will pretty much be on the record saying I think is the most beautiful sculpture ever created. Um, but also you have the inverted uh, pyramids in the Louvre, which used to be the, the palace. But here is this new age, for lack of better terms, you know, art installation within what was the old palace. And now it's a museum. You know, it's the story of not just the place, but also now the, uh, str uh, the infrastructure for the, the art pieces that were put in there. I see the, also the same thing whenever I see like Big Ben in Parliament uh, in London, because, you know, other than the fact that it is enormous, I told you it's enormous, it's huge, okay? But looking at that building, and seeing the grand scale of it, and then thinking what even comes close. I mean, I've, I've walked the Capitol Mall in DC, but still, standing by Big Ben, there is a scale that we don't really see a lot of here in the US. So for me, whenever I do this, whenever I travel, and I do something new, um, for me, time can stop. And that's something very special. Because travel for me is a time machine. Like here I am, you know, uh, being invited to give a talk on a travel log. And I'm recalling all these moments where, you know, we're up in the Musée d'Orsay of, of Paris, um, and this was the one shot that I wanted to do all trip. I didn't care about anything else. This was the one shot I wanted to try to get um, of my wife and I sharing basically our honeymoon kiss in the Musée d'Orsay in this huge clock. Because again, I'm a little bit of a horologist nut, and I love clocks. It's a weird tick about me. Okay, but thanks, hun, for laughing at that one. <coughs> that was in my notes, too. So anyway, the other thing, kind of getting away from the more sentimental part, there's other things that travel teaches you as a person, and especially as a couple, because my wife and I can kind of basically play things by ear. Uh, we have a joke. I'm jazz, she's classical, okay? but at the same time, we can still jam. And we did this trip with pretty much no plans, which I know some travelers get really scared and anxious about. Imagine just having three tickets, okay, three flights, okay, to jump around countries, but you have no hotel plans, no nothing. This is before Uber, folks. And wh what to do? But that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to be thrusted in because we didn't want to just travel as a tourist, per se, but kind of just blend in and feel the vibe of a city. And this is something we had done before, like when you move to a new place, you know, maybe you, you stay uh, in a hotel or now an Airbnb and kind of live a little bit in the city before you choose to do a big move. And we kind of wanted to take that type of ethos um, when we hit some of these cities. So funny story, apparently back in the day, uh, and hopefully this is the, the case, um, traveling without plans can also save you some money. So we got, we got in severely jet lagged uh, into London, and we come out of the, the metro, and we're like, okay, I'm super tired, I'm super hungry, we don't have a place to stay, what do we do? And Ariana goes, well, that looks like a hotel. It has uh, the GNH, I wonder what that is. Okay, so she goes in, stands for the Great Northern Hotel. It's this uh, old hotel that, that is on the original train line. And they asked us uh, if we had reservations, of course we don't, and they're like, well, you're in luck you qualify for the procrastinator special. And here we got this beautiful suite for almost next to nothing because we just needed it for one night. And they cut us a deal and it made it for a special instance. That, uh, that's Pancreas Station uh, and that was taken right outside of our suite. There's no way, you know, a young couple, fresh, uh, freshly married could afford that type of experience. But it, it, for us as travelers, we wanna feel the essence of where we go. 
no differently than I told you how I feel the essence of the Pacific Northwest here. Uh, and the great thing about that is, of course, you know, we always do that thing where it's like, oh, remember that time when? So like I just shared with you, remember that time when we didn't have any plans and it worked out and sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Well, remember that time when I was a Harry Potter fan and I wanted to get uh, one of the big double-decker buses and a long exposure on Tower Bridge with high traffic, no big deal. So here I am, uh, literally in the middle of a, a median, uh, Hopefully my mates across the pond aren't gonna send the police to me. But um, yeah, just to get that, this one shot because it was something I'd, I, I'd saw just because we were walking Tower Bridge and I thought it would look cool and it looks like Harry Potter to me. So we're really big about the vibe of a city. So this is a, a photo of Ariana in, in Paris and uh, I should also disclose she speaks French so it makes ordering a baguette uh, très bien. And one of the things about uh, being in Paris, and we had f we're, we're fortunate, we have friends that live in France. And so we were able to stay with them and, and kind of understand what it is like to be a local, not a Parisian, but a local. Being, and, and not necessarily doing all the touristy trap things. Uh, one of the things that I was trying to, uh, I was struggling with, I speak Spanish. Uh, and that flight, that 14 hour flight was not long enough on Duolingo for me to speak French at the time. So my whole goal is I wanted to learn at least how to order a baguette, order uh, a decent cup of coffee, and you know, just be able to get around. Meanwhile, Ariana is just you know, fluent, especially if she has three glasses of wine in her. Now meanwhile, in London, it's a completely different aspect for us. You know, we're loud, we're gregarious, with, we're with our mates, and um, a completely different vibe. But that's because these two cities have two completely different you know, vibes about them, and that's what we like to find uh, wherever we travel, and we try to blend in. Sometimes we're gregarious Americans, but you know, we have fun. And I also love it when I can see the sense of humor of a culture. So as we're sitting on the metro, I see this wonderful, this wonderful advertisement for this place in America known as Las Vegas. And I love, I love it when uh, cities our market, like, it's, it's interesting what kind of tropes other cities play in other cities for marketing and stuff, and how cu culture plays a, a part of it. And it's Vegas, baby. <laughs> so as I said before, we have dear friends. Uh, this is uh, uh, my wife's, uh, one of her oldest friends, Celine. Uh, the fun thing about this for my wife is she got into traveling because in high school, you know some high schools do exchanges? And really, it's just like, uh, you go over for two weeks, you never see each other, you never write, whatever. That's not their case. They're basically sisters. I got a French sister-in-law when I married my wife. And it's funny when they're together because it, they're just completely unique. Ariana slips into being French, uh, and even though she was born and raised here. Uh, what's great about having friends abroad is that when you go and visit, it kind of takes away that tourist aspect where you can actually kind of feel a part of the culture and you get to ask questions, you know, um, whether that's about politics or economics or just, you know, what not to say or how to say something or, you know, don't say a thing on the metro. Do you say something on the metro? Do I talk to somebody? Is that not cool? Like, you get to, you get to be a little bit of a safer dumb American when you have a friend that's of the country. Uh, I love you, Celine. One of the, the cool things that we did when we were on this trip uh, is, uh, so Lean had, uh, said that we should go up to the northwest, or sorry, northeast of, um, uh, of, of France, and it's this area called Bretagne, it's where Mont Saint-Michel is. But on the way, um, we learned about the different kind of toll roads and how to go around them and all this other jazz. And it was interesting because we made stops. And now, this is a quintessential American thing, right? You, you stop, it's the road trip, right? And it's funny because like France is considerably smaller than you know, American road trips go. I mean, you're thinking Washington, Oregon, maybe a little bit of Idaho, and bottom part maybe of California. It's all of uh, France in general. So this is a short trip for, by our standards, long trip by French standards. But we stopped in this, this great place um, called Clisson. And to this day, I, l I love this little village. Um, there's, it just is quintessential French. And it's funny because if you probably asked Frommers or that travel guy out of Seattle, that whatever, if you asked him like, 
they ever heard of Cleveson, they probably wouldn't. And it's these fun, happenstance, serendipitous places that you go because you didn't have an agenda. Remember, we flew in, quite frankly, jet lagged, with no agenda other than to just experience, as opposed to being scripted. I want to have this. I have my Instagram hit list. No, ah, it's serendipity. And that's, that's, that's something that stretches you because if you are that type A personality, I love you, hon, you know, it has to let you open up a little bit more. Now, the other thing that I learned from my wife is uh, mundane is an adventure. See, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. When we love to travel, we love to grocery shop, okay? Like, gr and I mean just generic, like go to the supermarché type of grocery shop or the farmer's market or whatever. Because one, you get some of the best food that way. Uh, if you travel and you don't cook, I would encourage you the next trip after the pandemic, uh, plan on cooking while you're abroad, if you can. Um, because one, you have to use the language, you have to interact with people, okay? And you have to experiment with foods and stuff while you're there, as opposed to just having it served to you on a silver platter. It's a very different travel experience. Uh, and of course, uh, France is well known for their cheeses and their produce, et cetera. Uh, for me, my, my, big, uh, my, my big step here was I had gotten just enough French to order a bouquet of flowers uh, for our, uh, Celine's mom as a thank you. Uh, and so that was, that was my claim to fame at this point. I couldn't do anything else, and you fleur, that was good. So when I travel, obviously I have the best type of, of keepsake, which is my photography. But the other thing I like to, to say is whenever, whenever I travel, like if you have friends that want souvenirs, see if you can't m make your souvenir. So obviously photos are the best thing, but uh, Moleskin, which is this little, uh, little pocket book uh, company that does uh, great little journals and such, they have stores, uh, storefronts everywhere. When you go to one of their storefronts, they actually have little stamps that you can stamp any book. You don't have to have a moleskin, they don't really care, but you can actually get the city's stamp for the moleskin shop. And so if you have somebody who is a paper enthusiast or a pen enthusiast, uh, how cool would it be to like get a moleskin of all the stamps, you know, as you do your travels and hand that to them and have them fill the rest of the journal out, you know? Uh, or this is how I, I typically travel. I have like notes that I keep and I keep this in my back pocket because it's about the size of a passport. The other thing, when we went to uh, Venice, uh, north part of Italy, uh, this is probably the most magical city I've ever been to, full stop. Uh, there's just something about certain cities or certain places when you go somewhere where your personality just jives. And uh, for some it's London, for some it's Seattle, for others it's Detroit, for me it's Venice. There's just something completely Harry Potter-esque magical, like there's everybody's muggles and I'm the only one that gets it. Like it's just crazy cool. Um, and when you're in Venice, take the roundabout way. Uh, there's these water taxis, uh, there's Vaporetti, uh, you don't have to take a gondola. We actually just went on the water taxi and for one day straight because it was horrible weather by most people's standards, it's just Pacific Northwest weather for us, we just stayed on the taxi and we hit every island from Murano to uh, Venice to uh, Lido and we just hopped around just for an entire day and in doing so we met different people and we chatted with people. There was a couple that we, we ran into coming from London to Venice and it's, it's this couple right here and we jokingly said because they're an older couple and we were a younger couple and it's like oh gee dad how we doing? And what was funny is we met up, because uh, we kept running into each other this entire trip, and so in Venice, in the, this Latin corridor, we, we decided to have breakfast together and we actually just shared who we were. And come to find out, he was a gentleman who works at Number 10 Downing Street. You know, he's, he's one of the people that works with the Prime Minister. And, you know, I'm, uh, to me, I'm just like, this is, this is insane. I would never have this experience if I didn't just, you know, be me and be a little bit of a goober and crack jokes. But it's being open and being open to talking to people. Uh, it's not a novel thing, but just being genuine. At the same trip, uh, this is uh, my friend. Uh, he's French. His name is Joe. He, uh, <laughs> there was this wonderful uh, New Zealand woman and her friend who was on this trip. Uh, we were up in the Capinale de San Marco. It's the big tower that you see in San Marco Square. And uh, they just thought that we were, we were just cute. They literally, they just thought, oh, you guys are just so cute. 
And so they came over and they wanted to photobomb us because uh, we were just having this great, this is great back and forth. And so I, and I handed her uh, my camera. I actually have another shot of uh, them just taking a selfie of them. And she said, there's a little something for you to remember us by. You know, it's it was great. When, when you open yourself up to other travelers and you open yourself up to other places, you learn more about yourself as well as the place that you're at. And you just have to, you have to be willing to be open. And, you know, I've, I have made some horrible faux pas in languages, but it's something that you learn it for the next time. The other thing I'll throw out, especially uh, when you're traveling, is travel when no one's looking. Uh, there's peak times that everybody travels, or you'll know when the, um, uh, like the cruise lines come in, especially in Venice, or when the cruise lines leave and everybody else leaves because it's dark, what is there to do? That is the best time to hit some cities. Where else can you get a shot of San Marco Square with nobody around, you know? And you basically have the entire piazza to yourself. You get to see how a city also winds down for the night when the gondoliers have to go and park all of their boats. You get to see the other side of a city, not just what is the postcardable stuff that is in the day, but seeing the yin to the yang of every city. It's part of finding that vibe. And I, th I find that a lot of travelers just go for snapshots, where I'm kind of going for more of a panorama feel. Uh, this is a shot of, of one of the inner, inner inlets of, of um, Venice. And uh, it's funny, because originally I put this photo in to remind everybody, like, uh, this, this person was, was literally, like, live streaming the entire gondola ride when they were there. And I think pre-pandemic, I would say something to the effect of, you know, uh, live first and share later. But something I noticed in traveling during the pandemic, um, we went to Florida for a little bit, and something I noticed a lot of people doing, because family members couldn't travel is that they were live streaming or sharing um, with family be because they couldn't make it out. And I think that's, that's a little bit of a different take than I would have had before the pandemic because I'm, I'm one who wants to be more present. But to offer the ability using technology to bring places that people would want to go but can't because of um, economics or because of a pandemic, I think there's a value to that. So this photo, originally when I had this in here, um, even me just kind of putting this presentation together, I kind of reflected and kind of realized that things have changed because of the pandemic. The other thing I want to point out when you're traveling is look up. You'll never know what you see. Like a, a, a lot of people, when, when we travel or just in your day, okay, the next time that you're out and about in Bellingham, let's say, count how many times you see yourself do this. We tend to keep our heads down a lot more. Uh, especially in these places that have these grander scales, uh, whether it's Paris or London or anywhere. You know, look up, keep your head up a little bit. In Venice also, by doing so, this is, uh, this is also in San Marco, this is the, the clock, is again, horology. Uh, it's a celestial calendar clock, and what's interesting about this is, is that it has the, the moon phases, has the day, date, uh, it has what uh, astrological uh, symbol, the phase, there's a whole bunch of calculations in there and it's been running for hundreds of years. The cool thing is, is that not a lot of people have ever seen the backside of it. And so when you travel, you know, get around something, okay? Don't just take something at face value, even if it's just the face of a clock. Venice taught me also a very, very valuable lesson, get lost. I don't mean that like Nate, like get lost. No, just get lost uh, because you'll find the coolest things. Now this is something that uh, as a Pacific Northwesterner, this is not something that I like to do because when you get lost in the woods, that's typically a bad thing. But when you're in civilization, yeah, you can ask somebody for directions. So this is something that, uh, this is an, a dead end that we found in, in Venice. Uh, and what I found funny is the devil is in the details. If you look in the, up in the top left, there's this great little like devil statue that's just in there kind of looking down. So we had this experience, my wife and I, and we kind of came to this epiphany. Uh, and again, there's a viewfinder, told you, they show up everywhere. Um, when we have a family, let's have our child learn from travel way earlier than we did. 
because my wife didn't really get into it until she was in high school and me when I was in college. And so, of course, we want our kid, you know, if and when we have one, we want to have, we want to get them hooked young. So that gets into my second phase, life and travel after a child. So two years and some months later, uh, we became pregnant and uh, we had a beautiful baby boy. And Dorian, we, we, we couldn't have been happier. Everything was just going great. And immediately we did what every couple has to do, which is the grand tour. You bring him to the grand, the grand uh, parents, you take him to your best friends, you show him off, you do that whole thing. So of course we travel with him immediately, okay? Throw him in that little bundle thingy, bundle wrapper thing, and you just go. I took him to the mountains, you know, because I wanted him to, to be, be blessed by the mountains as early as possible. And out of it, my, my wife and I have this other closeted secret. We're bag people. So we went through a lot of baby bags. So if you're watching this and you're wondering, what is the best baby bag? Get something minimal. Uh, my wife, we went through uh, like the big, you know, Swiss Army knife bag that has like the, the diaper area and the, the pad. And that thing was horking. Like Timbuktu looks like completely small compared to this satchel thing. And we kept downsizing to the point where literally the little carry bag that you put on the back of a stroller was our diaper bag. And that was our go-to, it was like the best bag ever. Um, because again, you don't need everything and the kitchen sink with your kid, <laughs> you really don't. But when you're a new, a new dad or a new mom, of course you're like, oh, I need to have this and that and the other thing and you lose things and just keep it simple. We also went to the east side, eastern Washington um, and uh, I showed him our pinwheel, uh, as, or as I like to say, it's our, our ecological hope for a better tomorrow. We took him to California so we could watch surfers, you know, and this is just shot off of uh, uh, the uh, Ventura uh, area. And then we, we, once we got kind of the states underneath our belt, we decided, all right, time to travel for real got to get him a baby passport. Did you know you got to get a baby passport? They're only good for five years, by the way. So if you want to go to places like Canada, uh, we got him his passport so we could go across the border. And we started basically from northern Vancouver all the way up to Squamish, which is the Sea to Sky Highway, some of the most beautiful extension of the, of the, the, Cas the, the Republic of Cascadia that we have, the Cascadian bioregion. And here's a picture of how sound. And if you are uh, looking to kind of get your feet wet as a new parent with a kiddo and you're like, I want to get, get a passport and kind of figure out what we're going to do in a different country. Canada is great. Uh, obviously, Canadian people are wonderful. They speak English, unless you're in some parts. Maybe you can even do some Quebecois, depending on what part of the United States you're in. But it's a great stepping stone as an American to get your feet wet with a kid and feel a little bit safer. And then, of course, on our side, heading up towards Squamish and the Sea to Sky, there's the Sea to Sky gondola that will take you up to the top of the mountain, and there's nothing but suspension bridges up there as well as uh, like a little uh, lodge where you can get a cafe and, and, and a quick bite to eat. But it is an amazing sight, especially to bring a little, because they have floating platforms off of a side of a mountain that you know they can look over and uh, inevitably drool uh, and feel the ability to hang off of a mountain safely or walk across air safely, okay? It's just a really magical place, especially if you're trying to um, get in views and also try to get the experience of, as a new parent, get your kid a baby passport. So after about seven months, uh, we had just come back from a, a trip to Kansas, and again, viewfinder, and we had to start dealing with something that we didn't expect would happen. And as I like to say, it was uh, turn to clear vision to our new normal. And what ended up happening, uh, I can remember the weekend pretty, pretty vi vividly. Um, this is my wife and our son, and I was getting ready to go on a photo shoot. And, yes, thanks buddy. And uh, I was packing up my gear and he was cooing and uh, my wife was finally kind of getting in the rhythm of being a new mom and breastfeeding and everything. And um, 
this was kind of the last weekend, I didn't know this at the time, this was gonna be kind of the last normal weekend as, as we would see it. Um, our son started to develop a skin condition and it started with just cheek redness, which m babies typically do. And it started to grow and grow and grow to the point of eczema like I'd never seen before. And then his skin literally just started to fall apart. Um, and we found out that he has uh, an atopic dermatitis with eczema and we had to figure out how to stop it. And nothing, we threw everything at it that we could, including the kitchen sink. And after several trips to specialists and allergists and doctors and, and everything, we had to actually end up wet wrapping him uh, with gauze and then dry wrapping him and changing these out because his, the skin barrier was literally just falling apart. Um, like most babies, they, they'll tend to you know, scratch themselves and they have really sharp little cat claws. Um, we actually had to get like a little baby straight jacket and restrain him because he would scratch himself because he's itching so much. And when this really derailed everything that we were be building up to. Um, and because we had aspirations of going back to Europe and, and doing other things and um, we had to try to get this under wraps. Now, I have a little bit of a derailment and it's, it's, it's instead of calling it travel life with allergies, it's life with allergies. Uh, I really didn't have a lot of exposure to this. Uh, I don't have allergies. My wife has a life-threatening allergy to, of all things, poultry. So imagine going anywhere in the United States and having to ask the server every time, do you do anything with poultry? Duck, chicken, chicken broth, chicken fat for every dish you ever have to do since you were a teenager. It's a struggle, because chicken is in everything in this country. Um, multiply that, we would later find out, I'll kind of give you the, the, the two years later, we would find out that Dorian had eight allergies. Okay, and that's what was causing this. But as young, uh, young ad adults with a kid, we really didn't have a clue. Um, this, is, this is how we tend to travel, which is uh, epinephrine pens, uh, our passport, um, emergency ID for allergies. And when you go to another country, you'll see on the bottom, these are all different ways that are saying allergic to. Uh, and these are things that you have to do when you have a life-threatening allergy. This isn't an intolerance, this isn't a choice. Um, literally, uh, one sip of broth and my wife is going to end up in the hospital and or die. And for my son, it can be any of his allergies. Three are kind of life-threatening for him. We've boiled down his eight to now three after five years, um, but it's still a work in progress. But at the time, this was, this was normal for my wife and I, but to try to, try to even conceive this as, uh, for our kid, we didn't even look at allergies at this point. We just thought, okay, he has, if there's something wrong, we just need to throw everything in the kitchen sink at him. And so, uh, we made, uh, we were masking before there was COVID. Uh, he would wear what we jokingly called the baby Deadpool mask, which is not a great thing to think about if you know about the comic, but his, his skin needed to be covered at all times to keep the moisture in. And um, this was our new normal. So we did this for two years. And at the beginning of it, because we were in that blissful phase, that silver photo that I showed you, um, we had just booked tickets to what was going to be our next big trip, which was Japan. And so we had to really ask ourselves, we were dealing with this, we didn't know it was allergies yet, we thought you know, we would just be able to get over it, and um, we, he was on steroids. Do we go or, or do we just wave it off? And it was one of those choices where my wife and I were like, no, if he's gonna be like this for the rest of his life, we need to, we need to figure this out as a family so that we can give him the tools to be able to deal with this because he's not going to just live in a bubble for the rest of his life. So we boarded a plane and we started our trek to Japan. And you have to understand, uh, Japan, I've never been a Japanophile. Uh, I was not one of those kids that loved anime in, in high school. My best friend Danny, my, my brother by choice, he totally was. He could tell you all the Pokemon and all that other stuff. I know Pikachu, it's cool. But I always have a deep respect for Japan because of the culture. Now, another travel tip I'm gonna throw out there is if you are traveling abroad and you have a baby, be sure to get on the line with the airline and ask if you can get a seat with the baby bassinet. 
This is something that we discovered on our flight back from Europe many years before we had him. And we're like, what is that? We talked to the travelers and they're like, oh yeah, it's the baby bassinet. Is it an upgrade? No, you just have to do it in advance. So what did we do? Well, we bought the baby bassinet. <laughs> and so we did. And it's basically this little pop-out thing uh, that kind of comes out of the bulkhead uh, on a certain row seating. And especially if you have a several hour flight, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hours, you know, having this if you have an infant is a lifesaver. So, you know, they can lay down, they can go to sleep, you know, you might be able to get some sleep. So, when we landed in uh, Japan, my wife always says this looks like a puzzle. It kind of does. You're totally right, boo. I've never seen density, urban density, in my life. I mean, I've seen like Paris and London, and that's dense or so I thought. And then Japan brought me to a whole new level. There's a reason why like uh, Tokyo, I believe, is like the either densest or most populative city in the world. It is amazing what a tiny island has done for housing and urban creation. This is Yokohama. Uh, this is taken from the, the top of, of Yokohama Landmark Tower. Uh, it's this tower right here. And um, this was just in, in Yokohama, which is a, a, a city uh, away from Tokyo. In Tokyo, there is also Tokyo Skytree. And so we went up to it, and I believe it's the tallest tower now in uh, Japan. And same thing, I, I had to see Tokyo from the, from, the, from, the, from the top down. And what's amazing, you can't see it, but unfortunately uh, there, was, there was clouds and smog and, and, and whatnot. So you couldn't see uh, Fuji, but on a clear day, I was told that you could see Fuji from the top of the tower. But it's just amazing to see how dense, it looks like a circuit board, like I'm a technologist. Like this straight up looks like a, a processor's die, which is ironic because Japanese in Japan are known for technology. And it, it's funny because like it's a density that doesn't, it didn't give me anxiety, I thought it would. There's something in Japan, again, kind of like the magic of Venice, that I realized like there's, there's, a, there's a vibe that Japanese culture brings to their cities. And I think you'll start to see it when, when I go further in my photos. Again, I like history. So of course, this w I wanted to see what I'd be seeing originally of Edo, original Tokyo. So this is kind of the same-ish shot. This was a, a poster below the, the viewfinder that I was taking this off of. Um, and you can kind of see that, you know, Quite, quite a lot has progressed since original Edo, Tokyo. And it's amazing to me to think that again, here is a country and a city that is older than our entire country. And seeing how much that they've developed. The other thing about this is, and this is Shibuya, this is the, the traffic crossing that you've probably seen on YouTube where there's hundreds of thousands of people that cross every day. Uh, it was amazing to go through here because I thought that I, I'd be like run into and stuff. And again, everything is just perfectly organized. Um, people kept distance and um, this is actually the first culture that I, 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 I discovered that when you're sick, you put on a mask. So when the pandemic happened, you know, it was interesting because I had that experience. Like it, it's just courtesy. It's part of the culture in Japan that if you're sick, you wear a mask. And when the pandemic happened and there was everything that happened here, it was interesting that the, the discourse that happened here versus cultures that already had that in place. And if I didn't have this experience in Japan, I wouldn't even know that was a thing. Like, oh, if you're sick, you put on a mask. That's what you do for your neighbors. It was interesting. So in Japan, there is a feng shui, there is a design method, there is a aesthetic. I, didn't, I don't know how to encapsulate it, but it is if Europe does a great job of trying to blend the old with the new, like I mentioned before. They do it different ways, but they do it very well. Japan blends nature with human creation and does it probably better than any other culture I've seen. Um, this is over at the Imperial Palace and just seeing the lines that are created by humans and the well-keptness of nature and preserving it, it's almost like a dance is the only way I can describe a lot of the aesthetic that I saw of, especially their, their historical and cultural uh, sites. The nature itself is a part of the scene and part of the architecture 
And you have to remember, like, these trees have been growing. So it's like to see it now versus when it was first established. It's kind of like when you plant a garden, especially here in Bellingham. Like, you plant a tree. It's like, oh, we're going to have apples 10 years later. We're going to have apples. And then, like, 20 years later, you finally get your first apple. And it was amazing to see, like, anywhere that I would look in Japan, there was this quintessential Japanese essence to it. Um, this shot, actually, I, I call is, like, is the quintessential Tokyo Japan vibe, you know, uh, this young lady was just waiting for her, her ride, and, you know, there's this beautiful structure behind her, and all the nature around it, there's layers, if you ever work in Photoshop, like, this is layers in the real world, in everything that they created. So, as I said before, we were on, just on the beginning of the journey that would be my son's recovery from his, his skin issues and allergies. So again, you saw he had to be wrapped and we had to put a lot of different medicine and salves and stuff on him. And again, that was our new normal, wearing a mask, being bandaged. So my wife and I had to kind of think, like, what are we going to do when we travel? Well, he wore a mask. And it was interesting, traveling in the United States, sitting on public transportation or whatever or whatnot, it was interesting kind of what looks we would get as parents that we would observe other people of having our son in this mask and you know it, it was a different vibe it was very standoffish is the best I can describe over here meanwhile taking this trip and my son walking around the grounds of of Kamakura or walking the Tori gates you know uh, we had several people come up Japanese elders that would come up and really, they, in the best uh, English that they could, they could ask, they would ask, like, is he okay? There was more of a concern, you know, is he in pain? How are you doing? It was a very different thing. It was the most welcoming uh, experience that we had in the early months of, of Dorian dealing with his issues. And it made us so infinitely more comfortable in Japan, even though we didn't speak the language. I don't know of any other way of putting that other than if you're a new parent and you are struggling with dealing everything that is a new bundle of joy and you want to tackle on travel, that is a big daunting task. Then add medical on top of that and then not knowing a language, there's a high level of anxiety that can come with that. But again, for us, it's an adventure. It's something to learn from. Luckily also, uh, my best friend and brother by choice, uh, this is Danny, I've known him literally, he's practically my brother. Uh, he, I've known him since high school. He's the equivalent of my Soline to, to Ariana. And he was stationed uh, in Japan. And so he, again, having somebody who is not native to Japan, but been there for decades, uh, I, I had sort of the inside scoop of, of what to look for and be able to ask those questions, such as the, um, uh, the immersion of, of uh, or not the immersion, but the kind of the amalgam of the different faiths that you see within Japan, as well as the architecture and such. Because like I said, everywhere I would look, I was amazed at the fact that you have these ancient, for lack of a better term, structures, human-made structures woven into the landscape of what looks like almost like the train here in the, in the Pacific Northwest. Japan literally felt like just a really old, urbanized version of the Pacific Northwest. So much so, of course, Danny said, like, well, you like to trek. Let's go up a mountain. So we go, because I really wanted to see Tori gates. These are those red gates that you see in a lot of photos. And I wanted to go specifically to a shrine. I wanted to see what a shrine is, what it's about, the protocols. Because in Japan, there's this weaving of Christianity and Buddhism and Shintoism. And it just, it's woven in a way that I just, it, I, I didn't understand. And so we trekked, my wife, uh, being a true Pacific Northwesterner, you'll notice that she is hiking in sandals, ladies and gentlemen, that hardcore. Uh, and uh, with, our, with our son in, in our little travel pack and stuff, because uh, at this point he couldn't, he, he couldn't hike, and still masked up, and we went up this, uh, this mountain, all so that I could get my walk through Torrey Gates. And what was amazing is that seeing all the people that were going through, uh, Japan had colors within their, their ceremonial uh, wardrobes 
that I think film doesn't even do justice. Because when we were there, there was this new couple, uh, I believe they got married, and so they were going to the, the temple and the shrine. And the color, like, you, you cannot shoot, if you're a photographer, you cannot shoot Japan in black and white. It, you have to shoot it in color, it's amazing. Um, but as we go up there and we're walking, basically shrine after shrine and uh, temple after temple, and, and it was amazing to go through all of this because um, the entire way I'm observing people and how they're doing their worship and how they're, again, this is on a mountain and in a mountain. I mean, literally in a mountain. And again, like I said, for me, going to the mountains here in the Pacific Northwest is, is, a, is akin to most people going to church. And literally, this was part of the ethos here. It was amazing to me. The other thing is, when looking at this as, a, as an outsider, as a, as a gaijin, it was interesting when we ran across this, and my wife got really giddy. See, we're gamers, and any gamer will know that's the Triforce. So if you're a Zelda fan, it was amazing to see this, and of course, Danny would fill me in, the fact that this was actually a crest of one of the, the families um, of this region. I can't remember the history off the top of my head. But also, after all that trekking, we found out there's a road. We could have taken the road up. Even Danny didn't know that. Well, learn that for the next time. But everywhere we went, uh, we were looking at how, and again, as a gamer, you know, seeing the Triforce. And again, this is interesting because you'll see in a little bit that gaming culture is also woven within the landscape of Japan. It's, it, you know, whether that is uh, manga or anime or our video game culture, you'll see where a lot of the art comes from within their cultural artifacts which I had no idea. I thought it was just, you know, created for a video game. So walking through uh, the various parts of Tokyo, um, this is the giant Buddha of Kamakura, and it is huge. You can see the person in the background right there. It's just a really big Buddha. And uh, on the back side of it, that's where we were when we were going through the Tory gates and such. Uh, kind of like we have state parks, and you sometimes you see people getting married. We actually saw a wedding going on. And it was a Shinto wedding. And so it was, it was fascinating to watch, again, underst understanding, um, not understanding anything about Shinto culture. And here they are in a public space, um, and the bride and the groom was getting married, and watching the protocols be, uh, around it. I said that perhaps the City of Light is probably the best place. I, I love chasing skies and stuff. Japan is probably a close second. Um, when the sun goes down in Tokyo, uh, the sky lights up. And uh, this is the, uh, the bell of, uh, I'm probably gonna slaughter this, so forgive me, I think it's Daijobu is the, the bell. And this is a huge gong of a bell. It probably is about, the bell itself is probably about half the size of this room, it's huge. Um, and the pagoda structure that holds it just reminded me of a, uh, of a specific uh, mushroom that we have here in the, in the Pacific Northwest. And you'll see the juxtaposition here in a little bit. But this is something that uh, may not be in tourist books, but it is something definitely to go see. And the park that it's in is absolutely stunning and completely serene. Some might even say Zed. Uh, if you have Netflix or whatever your streaming platform or choice is, you might want to see the film Hachi, which is this great film that'll probably make you cry if you love dogs. Uh, and there, the story of the dog is actually a true story, and there is actually a monument at Shibuya commemorating the dog, which I didn't know. Um, so there's a tie for film lovers. As a geek, Electric Town is gonna be where it's at for you, it's Akihabara, and this is where you will find vintage video games, you'll find technology, you'll find all of the cool stuff, but also some of the best street photography I've ever uh, done. And I'm not much for street photography, but it's really easy uh, in Akihabara because everything is just so lit up, especially right at golden hour. Uh, with the sun going down and all of the neon and stuff that is around, there's just so much to capture. The other thing is, of course, video games. Sega and Nintendo and everybody else is there. Uh, there's Gundam, there's like mechs, and it's just, it's like, if you've ever been to Las Vegas and you see like something uh, set up for like Marvel, that's, that's a prop. That's just every day in this.
this part of Tokyo. You just see robots. Or you see people doing Mario Kart in real life. No joke. You can, you can dress up as your favorite Mario Kart, turtle shells not included, and race the street, not race, but drive the streets of Tokyo in a Mario Kart. Next time, boo, totally doing that. Um, the Tokyo Tower, which is kind of like a, uh, kind of like a, a, a smaller version of, uh, say, the, the, the Eiffel Tower, is in the same type of vein. We, when we got there, we actually saw these uh, Mario and Luigi, our, our weary um, uh, uh, heroes, kind of heading home for the day. Uh, it was kind of a serendipitous shot when they were crossing the street. But um, it's, it's interesting because cosplay for us, you know, you have the Emerald City Comic Con or whatever. There's a lot of cosplay uh, culture in, uh, especially in Seattle and such. But here in Tokyo, like, this is just woven in um, because Mario, Luigi, Yoshi, Zelda, this is all part of their culture. And you can see the cultural ties that go back, as I showed, like, within um, their landmarks. When we went, we went during cherry blossom season. And it, if, if you've ever see, seen cherry blossoms here in Bellingham, it's cool. You see like the little berms and it looks like it's snowing. No, no, Though that, that, that's not snowing cherry blossoms. Go to Tokyo. There is entire piles, like we have leaves, okay? Mape, imagine the piles that you make of maple leaves, but in cherry blossoms. It literally does look like it's snowing uh, in Tokyo. Uh, we actually went out away from Tokyo and started heading out, uh, getting closer to uh, Mount Fuji. And what's interesting is if I showed you this photo and I said, where is it at? Probably many of you might say it's around here. And like I said, that's, that was the surprising part for me is Japan really did feel like an extension of here. The terrain, uh, the people, the culture, and the weather. I mean, it was very cloudy <laughs> and rainy. Uh, just wear another layer. But seeing this lake and seeing the hills in the background, this looks like you know, anywhere in the North Cascades. It looks anywhere around here, Diablo. And it, I felt home just with a lot more cherry blossoms. A lot more cherry blossoms. I want more cherry blossoms in my life. So this is where I'm going to get a little bit geeky. The other thing I love about Japan is that there are clocks everywhere. And Japan has a lot of history around clocks. They have Seiko. Uh, they have Citizen. These are two watch companies that have been around for centuries. And what's great is when you go around, especially if you're a horologist nut like myself, you start looking at the clocks and the different ways that they're designed. And also, you want to know who made them. So uh, this one night when, we were, uh, when Danny and I were coming back from something, I saw that there was this awesome clock made by Seiko. And it's got a boat on top. Because why not? It's just cool. Now, we also went to the kind of richer side of the district, which is Ginza. And in Ginza, there's a, uh, a watch company uh, shop uh, out of Switzerland called Patek Philippe. And uh, I would not been into one of those shops. So it was my first time that I actually got to go in and see uh, a Patek in, in the metal. And it was interesting because this shows a different side of also the same city where Ginza is very much the high end. You have Mont Blanc, you have Patek, you have all of these other uh, brands, uh, Grand Seiko, et cetera. And it is luxury to the luxury. It, it, to, as I told Danny, it, remind, it makes Rodeo Drive look like a garage sale in my book. Uh, Ginza was an entirely different echelon and it was amazing to see. Now, this next part, the Seiko Museum has moved to Ginza, the, the place that I just mentioned. Uh, but originally, it was not. It was in this like little suburb, way on the outskirts, and like I'm, I'm pretty sure we were the, uh, the first tourists that they'd seen in a while that weren't Japanese. Um, they were really excited to see Dorian and stuff. And the Seiko Museum is this, this uh, in, when we went, I can't speak to the new one, was the small museum dedicated to the watch, watch manufacturer of Seiko and its history. So. I'm part of this thing called the watch fam, and I'll talk about that later. So I have a wrist shot of my Seiko watch that I had toured throughout uh, Japan with on my wrist. And this is the entrance to the old Seiko museum, this huge Seiko clock. Uh, Dorian got enamored by anything with lights, because he loves lights. Uh, and they, uh, the, the, wonderful, um, uh, <laughs> the wonderful folks at the Seiko museum actually origami folded a paper 
watch for him uh, as, a, as a keepsake because he was just adorable and he didn't move so dad could go geek out about watches. It was great. Thank you, Boo. But what was great is, is that they have, uh, just like any other museum, they have pieces of the, the company's history. So you'll see like Laurel, which is one of their, their original pieces. And um, this is actually a prototype of the mechanism within Big Ben. Uh, they had that on, ex uh, on exhibit. They also had a lot of their technology. Uh, Seiko is known for uh, creating what's called the magic lever. It's this mechanism here on the right um, in their mechanical movements, which you'll see on the left. And this magic lever did something that uh, Swiss manufacturers had a hard time doing, which is wind going both directions. Um, so it was the, the Japanese ingenuity of this lever, and it, it's really a cool piece of technology. Seiko also, even though they're not a Swiss brand, uh, you know, a lot of the Swiss watches usually have a lot of claims to fame, such as Rolex, you know, being the, the, the watch of, of going down deep or Omega going up to the moon. Um, Seiko also can hold its own when it comes to those type of things because they had a watch that did a, uh, an EVA, uh, so a, a spacewalk. And also they were one of the original uh, uh, diver watches as well, which is uh, seen over here. If I could have one of those in my collection, I would love it. So, enough with the all uh, with the the uh, watch geeking. Let's talk food. Food. So, if you're in Japan, and I've said this on the Bellingham podcast, the best ramen in the world is going to be in uh, Yokohama, and it's at the Shin Yokohama Ramen Museum. It is a museum that is uh, done, themed out like. Um, 1950s uh, Tokyo. And so you have all of the ramens served out of this uh, themed uh, restaurant areas and it's all the different ramens from around the island because no, no ramen is just ramen. Every area on the island has its own broth, the ingredients, and it's unique to each region. And uh, you better go with an appetite because <laughs> these are big uh, ramen bowls, I usually say on the podcast, they're Chris Powell approved, they're huge, and they're, the, it is not your cup of noodle that you can get here. It's amazing. Now, the other thing that we love, uh, and anybody here in the Pacific Northwest, is our seafood, and Japan holds its own as well. Uh, obviously, they created this thing called sushi. Uh, it's also when Dorian got introduced to sushi, and to this day, he still loves what he experienced from Japan because he will eat anybody under the table for mussels, as you'll see later. Uh, Lake Fuji, uh, Lake Kawaguchi uh, is uh, one of the places that we stopped. And again, it was just making stops. No differently than when we were in Europe. You know, when you're with a local and you're doing a road trip and baby's going to baby, you're going to make stops. But what was great about this is we ran across kind of street food. And what was great is that it was all seafood. We don't have to worry about a poultry allergy for my wife. And, you know, there's octopus and squids and uh, 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 sea snails and all of it just on a stick. It was great. It's like the fair, but with way better food. And uh, Dorian got really attached to uh, octopus. Um, lots of octopus was consumed on this trip. Um, and uh, I think it kind of stuck because between the going and getting introduced to Japanese, uh, J uh, Japan and Japanese food at an early age and being a, a Pacific Northwest kiddo, again, he will eat everybody under the table for sushi rolls and mussels, just saying. So when, whenever you travel, uh, as much as I say, like try to get as much of the, the vibe of a city, it's also fun to see kind of like, um, you know, uh, the Las Vegas ad. It's also interesting to see what American brands do in other countries. So like what McDonald's serves in a different country, it's a different menu. So of course, being from the Pacific Northwest, we had to stop at Starbucks. And it was interesting because they had matcha uh, like frappuccinos, which weren't available here in the United States. And they also had an, um, an American drink that they imported called the cherry pie, which was this very uber sweet concoction with a pie top inside the frappuccino with a straw. I don't think we finished it, it was way too sweet. But it was an American drink. The other thing that I found interesting that it was 
in Japan, there was a lot of French cuisine. There was a lot of boulangeries, pâtisseries. But the difference between it uh, in, like, say, Tokyo versus in Paris was the presentation was immaculate. And French food is presented exceptionally well, but the Japanese take it a whole different level. And it's ingrained in, into their culture. Even if you go and you buy something, and I, I didn't, uh, I knew this after Danny had told me, you know, even if you have to bear, buy a pair of sunglasses, you know, they will take it, they'll wrap it, they'll present it to you. There, it, there's a lot of pride in everything, including the wrapping of when you get something. And so with food, it is a whole other level. Everything just looks like it's fake, but it is just that well presented. So that was the last trip that we had uh, before Dorian uh, really got sick. And it really, like I said, it derailed us for two years. But in those two years, um, several rounds of steroids, several rounds of specialists, allergists, pediatric dermatologists, we got better. And it's because, uh, luckily, my wife um, being savvy and ha having her degree in food and agroecology and understanding how food is made and produced here in the United States, um, and just our sheer will of just, we are going to do everything to get him better, um, he did. And it came down to identifying allergies, uh, food allergies as well as external allergies. He had eight, and with our specialist, I'm happy to say at the time of this recording, he is now down to three. Um, so we're bringing him down. Uh, there's still two that are life-threatening, but they're less life-threatening. Um, I know that sounds weird, but when you're off the charts for an allergen, and now you're actually you know, 99, you're actually back on the chart, that's improvement in our book. Because like I said, you saw him when he was at his worst. So for two years, we were in our own lockdown, trying to get Dorian better. And in that time, you know, we were stuck in the Pacific Northwest. I say stuck, but I love it. It's great. And so we got, we got him better. Two years go by. And we're getting ready to maybe go back over to Europe. Celine, Joe, see our friends. The year was 2019. I wonder what happened that year. So then everybody went on lockdown. All of our travel plans hucked out the window. And we were struggling, of course, with working and schooling in the new normal. What was funny is when that term was used, we already had our new normal. It was just, you know, we were dealing with our own thing as a family. And, you know, say la vie. We just kind of moved on. My wife and I jokingly say we were built for a pandemic, especially after dealing with uh, the, the issues that we had to do with Dorian. And so for us, um, Dorian was still before he could go, uh, he, was, he was still pre-K. Um, so uh, being a former educator, I uh, hacked my child. So we were doing learning games and we were reading and we were doing all the things that you do. But the other thing that we do as, as a family is we're a gamer family, as you could tell. Zelda, uh, you know, name it all of them. There's also one game that's near and dear to our heart, and that's Uncharted with Nathan Drake. It's the adventure game. And uh, Dorian, since a young, a young age, has played it. No, not with all the violence. We play the explorer side. So he quickly kind of glommed on to that game, and really, he, in his mind, that's what he looks like in his mind. He's Nathan Drake. When he goes out to Whatcom Falls, he has, doo -doo 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 -doo, like he has that theme playing in his head. Um, and it really fostered, I could tell, that, that adventure spirit like I had as a kid. I was, me, it was Indiana Jones, there was no Nathan Drake, dating myself. But again, I could see it because I was that as a little kid. The other thing that we did is we were, we were gamers in tabletop style. Because again, as an educator, uh, I know the history behind a lot of original gaming. And they were tools for teaching and for learning. Whether that is chess, Go, Backgammon, Mangala, all of the uh, Snakes and Ladders. All of these games were originally tools to teach youth sharing, turns, strategy, mathematics, reading. So in a lockdown, start breaking out games. So before he was four, he knows how to move the pieces on a chessboard. Now, is he the greatest strategist and is he going to play blue? No. But he can play a game with me as we listen to chill hop music and drink tea. 
So as a technologist, of course, and this was something that uh, a lot of parents struggle with, is screen time. What do we do about screen time? Well, if you're daydreaming about travel, get them uh, hooked on travel through learning language. So two apps that I want to throw out, especially uh, if you're looking for them, if you have a pre-K yourself, Endless Reader and Endless Reader Espanol. Uh, these have monsters that are cute, and they have activities with reading, and they have monsters. Did I mention the monsters? Every kid loves this app, OK? Available for you know uh, all the platforms. The other thing I will throw out, which uh, has just come into its own with him uh, recently, is Duolingo ABC. Now, you might know Duolingo, a little green, e uh, gr green owl that um, uh, helps you learn a language as an adult. They have a kid's version um, that's great for doing sight words and, and learning how to write your, your letters. Well, what I just found out, because I've been using Duolingo to, to better my French skills, is that the characters are grown up in the Duolingo for adults, and they're the kid version. So he actually knows all the names. Like, there's Oscar, there's Eddie, there's Junior. He knows them. And he actually plays Duolingo French, the adult version, with me. And so he's learning French in an adult course because he's already done the English course as a kid. And that's pretty cool for somebody who's five years old. I didn't start learning language until I was in high school, so other than some, some broken Italian. So I had that in my back pocket, and I invented adventure school because my son needed to get out. As any parent will tell you, they got to get out of the house. And so for me, especially because uh, the pandemic kind of sideswiped my wife, she lost her job, she started going back to school, I needed to get him out of the house for finals, fast. So I created uh, Adventure Goji. Uh, so pedagogy is the study of, of learning, so Adventure Goji is the study of learning adventure. At least that's what I'm coining it as. And start small. Uh, anybody can embrace Adventure Goji, and that's why I would encourage you to do, because it teaches valuable skills, so especially in the Pacific Northwest. Even if you can identify plants, like stinging nettle, you only make that mistake once. Or you can learn what stinging nettle is and help even adults stay away from it. But uh, my son really loved staying in a tent. What kid doesn't? No, you don't understand. He really, first time he got into a tent, he wanted to be in a tent all the time. So he got a tent and he practiced camping. He was hooked. And so I wanted to foster that because Dorian's really independent, like to a fault. We talked about flora and fauna, what you can eat, what you can touch, what you can't touch, like stinging nettle, blackberries, etc. These are all things that um, some adults don't know, what you can eat, what you can touch in this, in, in this part of the, the woods. I mean that literally. Uh, we did this through a multitude of ways, me taking him out and him uh, ex experimenting, uh, acting as Shellington there with a, with a magnifying glass, but also just through book work, because again, I needed to teach him how to read. And in it, he could experience the Pacific Northwest and all of our flora and fauna, and he also got to see some of the crazier things we have. A lot of people forget, we have some crazy stuff. Like for instance, this mushroom. This is not photoshopped. This is a mushroom that you can find commonly anywhere in our woods. Anybody know the name of it? It's an ink cap mushroom. And what it does is it actually starts as a white dome until it gets this point. It's kind of like an avocado. When you look away, it turns brown. And w this white dome flares out and then starts dripping black because it's its spores. Now, I had grown up seeing these, and I didn't know what it was until I was teaching him what it was. And it's one of those things where, again, you don't know what you don't know until you start opening up. And you don't really know what you don't know unless you can teach it and actually know it. One of the things that I grew up doing was marksmanship uh, with firearm safety and uh, doing the respect of, of firearms. And I love marksmanship. Well, up here, the one thing that I Again, as a kid, as an adventurer, I also loved Robin Hood, and I always wanted to do bow. I never did. Uh, in my adult, uh, as, as an adult, I grew up, and I finally got to become Robin Hood, uh, ran the Bellingham uh, Diathlon that happens up at Lake Tyrrell. And um, I, I've been hooked ever since. And so uh, Dorian uh, just learned how to do archery from me. 
And what's great about this is the archery range, we have an archery range. It's just uh, north of us. It's in between Ferndale and Lummi. And it's for a modicum fee. I think it's like $5. And it supports the archery uh, kids group up in Ferndale. You just put your discovery pass and you have access to basically a Hunger Games-like course of golf, but for archery. You have like different like holes, as it were, different uh, targets set up on different uh, banks and stuff so that you can perfect your target practice. So by the time he hit three and he'd seen dad's stories and heard dad's stories about climbing mountains, he wanted to do it himself. So I said, okay, you can't do it by yourself. I will go with you because I don't think you know how big a mountain is. And so uh, I took him up to the Oyster Dome. And this was several, we built up to this. This was not just a, you know, we're going to do it on a random weekend. We'd been walking, we'd been hiking, we'd done smaller trails, we'd gone around the Stimson, we've done everything to build up to this. And most people can do the Oyster Dome. It's, it's a morning type of a thing, a couple hours. Of course, with somebody who's three years old, it was an all-day ordeal. It was an expedition. But it was worth it because when he got up there, he was on top of the world in his mind. And on top of that, he did it. Along the way, he got to uh, see kind of the wonder that is the forest because you're out on the trail and it's the deepest you've been. And out of it, I had to, as a dad and as an educator, I had to come up with rules because again, I told you, he's independent. So off the cuff, I made up the mountain rules. And so this is a, a video of them. Uh, I don't know if the audio is coming through, but. Very good. Okay. Rule number three, always pay attention. But I was making up these rules on this hike and uh, he gets one rule for every year that he's alive. So he was three, he got three mountain rules. And if he wanted to keep going, he had to abide by the mountain rules. And these rules, you know, are also things that any parent wants any kid to know. Like, okay, listen to me, okay? Do what you're told, that type of thing. And it was a way to bridge discipline as well as the love and uh, independence that nature can bring. So we did it. And uh, the other thing that I like to throw out is when you do treks, you can take photos for the gram. You can, uh, you can count your steps. You can also, if you have a GPS tracker, like a phone, or if you have a Garmin, you can also record maps. And that's something that we started collecting. So wherever we travel, wherever we climb, we actually collect the map of where we climbed. And it's a way that you can relive uh, the service that I'm showing here, and I have to give credit to Danny, he showed me this years ago, is called Relive, where if you do take photos, it will plot it on the map, so you not only remember the, the snapshot in time, but where you were, and you actually can go through it. If you're wondering what mountain rules are, he's five, so he has five. I won't tell you what number six is. Tune in next year. You have to invite me back. Uh, rule number one, listen to Dada and Mama. Uh, number two, do not goof around. Always pay attention, be careful, and only go as far as you know as you can get back, because these are all rules that any alpinist, any mountaineer, again, these are five-year-old versions, you know, don't goof around. You always, you're always paying attention when you're on the mountain, okay? You are always being careful. Situational awareness. Never go as far as you know as you can't come back, okay? Again, like I said, the mountain doesn't care if you summit or you live or you die. I'd rather him learn these lessons at five and know them as mountain rules. Keeps him out of trouble. And out of it, we've had amazing adventures. Uh, he's climbed uh, Winchester, he's climbed Mount Erie, he's climbed uh, uh, the Oyster Dome, and then we've gone on trails, such as going uh, and doing some cave exploring. All along the way, we're also teaching orienteering. So he can tell you north, south, east, west. Okay, west is where the water is, east is where the mountain and the snow is, north is Canada, south, and that's where we usually leave it. <laughs> um, but he's also been able to see the beauty that is our Cascadia region and do it all on his own, on his own steam. And it's built confidence. Something else I'll throw out is if you do any treks, stop into the park service. National parks, you can actually have your uh, kiddo sworn in as a junior ranger. They have to do some activities. 
Uh, and it's also great if you're doing a long road trip because they need activities in the back of the truck. And uh, if they do all the activities and you bring them back, they get sworn and they get a little badge, which is really cool. That's something that we have as a crown jewel. We have state and national treasures. And it's one of those things where whether you are adventurous and you love backcountry or you just love lighthouse gazing or you love the beach or whatever, it's all driving distance here in Washington. It also prepares you uh, and gives you skills. This is how my son is kitted up when we go trekking. Uh, he's four and four-ish, five-ish in that photo. Um, this is how uh, he, he has stamina, he has patience, he has the mountain rules, of course. And he also loves this thing called the Octonauts. Water is his next big adventure. It kind of petrifies mom a little bit because he can't swim. But um, it's one of those things where he wants, he's open to trying new things and discovery. And isn't that what every parent wants their kid to do? We've also done stuff at altitude. We've climbed Table Mountain, which is up at Artist Point. And uh, uh, I've, uh, when we were up there, there's actually a young couple that had a little bit of uh, vertigo. And uh, Dorian actually went up to the young lady and was just like, it's okay, you can do it, do you need help? And helped her down off the mountain. And I'm pretty sure her boyfriend uh, didn't hear the end of it off of uh, Mount Baker for taking her up that hike. But, you know, he was encouraging. He's not afraid to go and talk to another climber, another hiker, another adult. Again, another skill that you hope that your kid has. And it's funny that something as solo as hiking has helped foster that, especially during a pandemic when everybody's been locked down. We were able to get out. Now, of course, because I said he loves the Octonauts and he loves water and I love free diving and snorkeling, uh, and we have Lake Whatcom, we go treasure hunting. And this is my little public service announcement for Bellingham, I am looking at you. When you're dealing with our waterways, okay, treasure them. What we do is we go treasure hunting. Uh, he, because he can't swim, he sits up on either the paddle board or the duck. We call this duck diving. And uh, he will have his, his goggles and he'll look down on the water and let me know what treasures are down below. And then I go down on a single breath and pick them up and draw them up every time. And we go and throw them away or recycle them. On Father's Day, that is what I brought out of Lake Watcom. Humans, be better. We're treasure hunters. We shouldn't have to be. Another thing that is a, a, a I don't know if it's a well-kept secret, is the uh, Osprey shipwreck, uh, which is uh, down off of uh, Locust Beach. And it's this uh, big sailboat that uh, has been uh, run up ashore. I believe uh, WWU's Clipson did an article about it about six, seven years ago. It's been tagged up now, but it was, again, it's a shipwreck. And it's here in Bellingham. What kid wanna, wanna explore that, right? So as we built up his skills and we built up his stamina, uh, cold also had to be conditioned into him. So we trek all season, winter included. Um, and, you know, again, it's a different skill set because also when you're in the snow, you know, you can't see a trail. So what do you do? Other skills uh, kind of come out of just simple treks. And of course we get dirty. Kids need to get more dirty, okay? And yes, parents, I know you're looking at this going, oh no. Okay, water, just water hose them or something. Bring, no, I'm just kidding. Bring an extra pair of clothes uh, when they come back. I mean, even when I climb, I have like my base camp set. I want to strip out of everything that I just spent 14 hours climbing and get into something comfy. Do that for your kids too. That way they can get dirty. So uh, I made a, a, a list of things because I mentioned a lot of our climbs. And if you're not from around here, Billy, I'm looking at you. Here's the list that we did between uh, 2019 and, and 2021. Uh, Oyster Dome, uh, climbing the Bullwood Pitcher over in eastern Washington, Goose Rock over in Whitby Island, Table Mountain, the Lost Lake to uh, Baya the Rock Trail, uh, which is really cool. Um, because I'm an academic and we like graphs, that's pretty good for a four-year-old and a five-year-old in a season, I think. Putting in 50 miles in a season and learning. And then, of course, I reap the benefits because I also get to stay healthy because I want to have a long life so that I can see him grow up. And as a family, we're healthier. So 
Uh, and I know I've got about 15 minutes left. I wanted to get into a little bit of kit, because what person in the outdoors doesn't like, you know, gear? Something I want to bring up when, you, when you're hiking with a little is find out what they'll hike for. For Dorian, it was snacks. If you summit, you get graham crackers. Oh, yeah. Five miles, done. Okay. Uh, the other thing that was an accident was a flag. Uh, one of the apps I use is called Maps.me, and when you have a location that you pin, you use for, uh, uh, for your, your uh, GPS, it puts a flag. So we got to the top of Mount Erie, and he was really upset there wasn't a flag. Next time we went on a trek, I brought a flag. It happened to be the Bellingham flag. And that was something that we did. And whenever we summited a place, uh, he got to hold the Bellingham flag because he earned the flag. Um, again, uh, I'm a watch guy, and my son is starting to turn into one. Uh, I'll get into watches in a little bit, but also bring a compass and let them have it. Let them try to find north. Let them figure out where they're at. I think more and more we need to be better at, just even as adults, I know some adults that get turned around and don't know north, south from east to west. And trying to have uh, a sense of place and location. So apps and tech, uh, uh, I have bit.ly links so you don't have to worry about Googling. Um, I, most of this I've written up. Seek uh, is a great app if you want uh, to do things like identification and you're not familiar with certain plants and stuff. Merlin is out of Cornell's Lab of Ornithology for birds. Relive is mapping, you'll see that in a second. Combine that with Garmin, because I'm in the Garmin ecosystem because I have a Garmin instinct. Um, geocaching and maps.me. Relive uh, is the service that I mentioned before where you can use your GPS uh, uh, device to be able to log a trek and then any uh, photos that are there will get mapped to it. And again, we like to collect maps. That's our thing, is that when we go, that's a souvenir because we can see the achievements that we've done. So all of that, if you, whatever device you use, I encourage you to use, it's the technologist in me, um, GPX files are universal uh, global positioning exchange files. And pretty much it, that way in the future, you're kind of future proofing yourself and you're not in a, a specific ecosystem. Seek is basically, like I said, if you want to know what that pretty flower is, can you eat it? You know, that's the type of things that you can use within Seek. And geocaching. This is something that Bellingham has a lot of. And if you want a kid to even know just better where streets are, you know, have them go geocaching. And if you're not familiar with geocaching, it's a community-driven uh, org that basically puts out caches, treasures, and you have to use a GPS to go find it, and there's a log, and you get to log what it is, and you get to exchange treasures. Sometimes there's like little coins or little dinosaurs or whatever. And it allows them to go on a real-life treasure hunt, which is really cool. Also gives them place because you can do it in any city, or they can get to know their own neighborhood better. Another thing, and this was something that was a hit within the mom group that my wife was in, is what do you do about communication? When do you get a kid a cell phone? I am a radio kid. I grew up with a ham radio family. I still am a ham radio operator, KD7OGZ. And uh, I wanted my son to get into that ethos as well. So uh, as soon as he could talk, he's had a radio in his hand. Um, so he has just one of these simple FERS, FRS, Family Radio Service radios, uh, really inexpensive. And what's great about it is it gives him freedom when he's on trail. If he can go, he can go a little bit ahead, again, going as far as he knows he can, he can get back. But if something happens, we can get a hold of him and he can get a hold of us. It also has helped with training of walking home from school as a kindergartner. You know, you don't have to have an extra cell phone plan. It's all over the air because, you know, they're just walking a block. It also uh, allows him to take turns because radio, you have to push down, etc. There's other skills that are attached to it. I know the big kids, like college students, love hammocking, but boy, howdy. If you don't pack a hammock when you backpack, pack a hammock the next time, especially if you have a little. Because it's great just to have something to throw up between two trees or wherever, just so that they can have a place to, to rest and you can kind of recoup as well because trekking with a little, you're doing a lot of double duty. You're teaching as well as in trying to enjoy the, the trek. The other thing I'll throw out is get them a camera, even if it's just a little toy camera. 
Now, yes, I'm a pro photog, so he's seen me work, he's come to work with me, and uh, he also loves taking pictures of dad taking pictures. What's great is it's not a phone, it's not an app, it has buttons to it, and as he grows up, he can use bigger cameras, real cameras. This is a twin lens reflex camera that I have at the house, and again, it helps foster exploration, because here's something that most kids, most adults haven't had their hands on in a century. And it's something that he can keep in the back of his mind, and as he grows, he can grab any of my cameras, and I don't have to worry about, you know, one of daddy's $3,000 cameras dropping. He knows what it is, it's a piece of kit. But also more importantly, and I think this is more important for, for families, is we get to see things from their point of view, and it's a dedicated device to do it. Now this could be a GoPro, this could be a toy camera, just get them a camera. Um, I prefer something with buttons. Now I will admit, they will not get it at first, okay? Because he sees the lens and the lens takes the picture, it goes right here, right? He will not get it, okay? They will not be Ansel Adams at first, okay? It took a while, but he flipped it around and he started taking photos. You know, by the time he was three and four, he was he was getting better. They're still a little bit out of frame, but you know, he's starting to look for artistic stuff. He also developed people skills, and this was something that we had on trail. He's not afraid to go up to a person and ask an adult, hey, can I take your picture? And he took this woman's picture. <laughs> Over the moon, a little four-year-old. It also teaches him to be a ham and also just, quite frankly, to be my grip, to be a person that can help me set up gear and stuff, which is great. And, you know, mom finally gets some photos of her being goofy as well. But uh, he's, my little, he's my little dude. Um, and what's great is even when he didn't have a real camera, this is just a little Fisher Price toy, you know, he's into what dad's into. And whether that is when I'm on a shoot or at home, in a tent or whatever, he's practicing. And that's what kids need, is they need to practice. Read. Now I know that's self-explanatory, but read literature from our area, whether that's the, the, the Wilkinshaw book on Puget Sound, uh, of uh, an account of like the development of, of, uh, of our region, but mountain books, uh, cultural books of this region, read that to them so that they know where some of these locations are and when they came about, or juxtapose things. So for instance, I love Jules Verne, um, Journey to the Center of the Earth, we read it, as well as uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Sorry, boo, I'm not getting the submarine, I'm not Captain Nemo. But we did go through the ape caves and uh, juxtaposed like what it might have been like for the Jules Verne novel of going through the center of the earth. If you do do the ape caves, uh, the benefit of having a mask during the pandemic was a huge, uh, huge benefit. Um, because there's a lot of particles in the air. So pandemic or no, if you do the ape caves, I would encourage you to wear a mask anyway. The other thing I will throw out is, and uh, I have a little bit of a benefit to this. Um, I worked for the Lummi Nation for a couple of years and I got to know a little bit better about the cultural history of our region and the oral traditions and the history that, is, that a lot of us don't know or we don't know what to look for. And I think we need to be better about it so even if it is just looking, we have story poles everywhere. Read them, or better yet, have your kid read them to you. And if you can, integrate some of either Chinook jargon or uh, uh, Waklami Chasen. Use the words that were spoken here long before we were. That is something that I think, before we look at learning another foreign language, we should look at the languages that we had here first. So it's funny, if you ask Dorian, you know, some of our trail friends, if he sees like a, an eagle, he might call it, hey, that's our friend Kualingsen, or Squatok, or Blackbird. He knows some of the, the, the Lummi Chasen, and I, I have a great appreciation to the, the elders and some of the teachers that I had uh, when I had my time up there, like Smakia and uh, Hoholeitsa, Haishka uh, Siem, for all that you've taught me, so that I can pass it on even to my, my little because I want him to be aware of the history. No differently when we go to France or we go to Germany or we go to London, we wanna know about that history, but we should also be respectful of the history we had here. Cooking, because again, of course, we have food issues, so 
uh, camping and cooking, that's the best time. They can get messy, a pot spills, whatever. You know, start them off with coffee. I'm just throwing that out. That way you have coffee. You're welcome. So to wrap up, um, hiking with a little, you're going to go on a slower journey as an adult. It's more about them and not you. And that's nice, especially if you're an alpinist. It kind of keeps you centered. Um, and it also teaches them things that are bigger topics, like situational awareness and body awareness, pushing their limits carefully. Some of the things that most adults will hear, I'm tired, I can't, it's hard. Are we there yet? Does not happen in our house. You know why? Hey, boo, really? Is it harder than climbing a mountain? Really? Put your shoes away. You have, you have something that they can point to because when you have an accomplishment like you've done 3,000 feet of vertical for, before you were four, or you were able to see a sunrise at 6,100 feet at you know six in the morning. Remind them and let them, not, not just remind them of what they've done, but let them show you what they've learned, whether that is they know how to do a radio, so if they want to walk home, they know that they can talk to you. Or, you know, whenever you're out, oh, are we going north? Is that where Canada is? Let them bring back what they've taught, or let them teach you what they've learned. So I would be remiss if I didn't have a shout out to my, the Watch Fam, and this is something that uh, is just a quirk of me if you can figure out. The Watch Fam is a community of watch enthusiasts that are predominantly online, and I'm, I'm one of them. I've been a watch kid all my life. Uh, and during our treks and travels, I always have a watch on me um, because phones die. It's a, an essential piece of kit, if you ask me, when you're out in the wilderness. Um, and what's nice is, as a dad, I now can look back and see all these treks in the watches that I've worn with him. You see them throughout my, my photography. Um, and it's funny because I can look, not just at my photography, but look at the watch I'm wearing, like the one I'm wearing today, or tonight. And I can see, oh yeah, that was that one time that we went up. And again, it's that time travel through traveling. And I can do it not just through photography, but also through this little heirloom that I have on my wrist. It started because I created a watch for him um, with a, an engraving with a compass rose of the north, south, east, west, and also the coordinates of here, of 100, uh, 120, uh, 40 degrees north and 122 degrees west, so that someday when he grows up, wherever he ends up in the world, he can hopefully remember and that watch has some of the stories of our travels here and some of the cultural importance of the Pacific Northwest, wherever he starts to develop. The watch I'm wearing tonight is actually a, a, a French watch. Um, it's made by a company called Baltic, and it's made out of bronze. It was a gift from my wife. Uh, as the Father's Day leading into the pandemic, and little did I know I'd be wearing it for a year straight. It started off looking bright and happy and pretty. The thing about bronze is that it patinas, and no two bronzes are going to be the same. And what's great about this is, this is the pandemic. This is 365 days of adventure school, the new normal, masking, everything. It is also for us a pandemic of patina of adventure and what he's learned, what we've learned as a family in the last five years getting through it. For me, it was the watch that I took to the summit of Mount St. Helens uh, when I summited uh, it, uh, last season. And all of this started because my wife and I were uniquely Cascadian and we wanted to grow our family. So that's trekking and traveling with a toddler. Thank you for attending. I'm AJ Barce. Can I move yet? Billy, do you come up yet? What do I do? We didn't do this part of the script, man. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Any questions online? Hello, live streamers. No questions online? Okay, that's cool. <laughs>